The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Food for Soul and Goa Co-working present today's readings and reflection. December 14th, 2021. Memorial of St. John of the Cross, Priest and Doctor of the Church. A reading from the book of the prophet Zephaniah. Thus says the Lord, Woe to the city, rebellious and polluted, to the tyrannical city. She hears no voice, accepts no correction. In the Lord she has not trusted, to her God she has not drawn near. For then I will change and purify the lips of the peoples, that they all may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, and as far as the recesses of the north, they shall bring me offerings. On that day, you need not be ashamed of all your deeds, your rebellious actions against me. For then will I remove from your midst the proud braggarts, and you shall no longer exalt yourself on my holy mountain. But I will leave as a remnant in your midst a people humble and lowly, who shall take refuge in the name of the Lord, the remnant of Israel. They shall do no wrong and speak no lies nor shall there be found in their mouths a deceitful tongue. They shall pasture and couch their flocks with none to disturb them. The Word of the Lord. The Responsorial Psalm. The response is, The Lord hears the cry of the poor. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be ever in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the Lord. The lowly will hear me and be glad. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Look to him that you may be radiant with joy, and your faces may not blush with shame. When the poor one called out, the Lord heard, and from all his distress he saved him. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. The Lord confronts the evildoers to destroy remembrance of them from the earth. When the just cry out, the Lord hears them, and from all their distress he rescues them. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and those who are crushed in spirit he saves. The Lord redeems the lives of his servants. No one incurs guilt who takes refuge in him. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Alleluia, Alleluia. Come, O Lord, do not delay, forgive the sins of your people. Alleluia, Alleluia. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the chief priests and the elders of the people, What is your opinion? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son said in reply, I will not. But afterwards he changed his mind and went. The man came to the other son and gave the same order. He said in reply, Yes, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did his father's will? They answered, the first. Jesus said to them, Amen, I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. When John came to you in the way of righteousness, you did not believe him, but tax collectors and prostitutes did. Yet even when you saw that, you did not later change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Reflection on Today's Readings by Bob In three days we will begin focusing on the first Adventus, coming, of the Lord Jesus in the Incarnation in the womb of Mary and his birth in Bethlehem. On this day, our attention remains on the second, or final, Adventus, coming, of the Lord Jesus. 
Today's readings speak of our making a choice on how we are going to live out the rest of our earthly life and show that we are ready for the day of the Lord Jesus' final coming. The reading from Zephaniah announces that the day is coming when those who have not followed the Lord will be removed, while the faithful remnant will experience a new sense of peace. The responsorial reminds us that God hears the cry of the poor. In the Gospel, Jesus challenges the religious leaders by sharing with them a parable of a parent of two children. When the parent asks the two offspring to do something, one says, no, but ends up doing what is asked, the other responds with a, yes, but does not do the will of the parent. The reading from Zephaniah follows the prophet's declaration of the day of doom when God will exact judgment on the unfaithful believers. Having described the Dizere, day of wrath, for the sinful people before the exile, the prophet now turns to describing the mercy and compassion which the Lord will extend to the faithful remnant. Once God has separated the unrepentant and disobedient from the those who have remained obedient to the Lord, the Lord will extend a period of peace and justice to those who have sought to be faithful to the Lord. God will pour out the divine blessings on those who are left, the psalmist proclaims the praise of God who removes the disobedient and sinful, but who listens to the cry of the anavim, the downtrodden, outcasts, and poor. God is always close to those who call upon the name of the Lord. God will act with mercy and compassion on those who have been faithful and yet have experienced the trials and tribulations of life, particularly at the hands of evildoers. In the Gospel, as Jesus speaks with the authority figures of the Jewish faith, he asks them to discern which of two children is truly obedient to the wishes of their parent. When the parent asks the two kids to perform a certain task, the first speaks words of refusal, but later does what is asked. The second one, in contrast, responds with words of obedience, but does not do what is being asked. Jesus compares the religious leaders to the second son who says, yes, but fails to do what is requested. The repentant public sinners are compared to the first child who initially refuses to do the parents' demands, but later fulfills what is asked. As we draw to the end of this first part of the Advent season, we are called to reflect on our response to doing God's will. It is easy to say, yes, to God, but it is harder to actually do what God asks of us. On the other side of the coin, there is hope for us who have sinned and had said, no, to the Lord God. We can still change our ways and begin to more fully respond to God by doing what we know is being asked of us. The first reading reminds us that we will all have to answer to God at the second coming of the Lord Jesus. The final judgment will be a Dizere, day of wrath, for those whose final earthly decisions have been atheos, against God. Yet for those of us who have repented of our sinful ways and have striven to be ad deum, toward God, it will be the beginning of the final and eternal reign of God which has begun during Jesus' life on earth, but will reach its climax in heaven. I need to spend some time during these pre-Christmas days to reflect on my life with God. Nothing is more important than looking at my relationship with my loving Abba Father and with the Son of God who has come and is coming again. The personal question or action for today, am I oriented toward God, ad deum, or am I moving away from God, a theos? Of what do I need to repent or, in other words, what course corrections do I need to make in being more on target, more aligned with the God with whom I hope to share all eternity? 
How can I manifest my orientation in a way which will be inviting to others to come with me as I aim toward an eternal future with God? How can I more fully live a life that reflects the words of the psalmist today, I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall be ever in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the Lord, the lowly will hear me and be glad. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord God of all those who call upon you. Through your goodness, you not only hear their prayer, but you also respond in ways which shows your compassionate love. You desire that all people not only say, yes, to your plan for their lives, but that they orient themselves to following you in all aspects of their lives. For the times we have failed to respond to your requests of us or said, yes, but not done what we said we would do, we seek your forgiveness and pardon. With the help and example of your Son, Jesus, and the guidance of your Holy Spirit, motivate us to obedience. Correct those part of our lives which are out of sync with your will. We give you all the glory, praise, and honor as we await the return of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the way to you, and who is living and reigning with you and the Holy Spirit, our one and only God, forever and ever. Amen. Saint John of the Cross, Priest and Doctor 1542-1591 December 14th, Memorial Patron Saint of Contemplatives, Mystics, and Spanish Poets A priest's love of God is purified by the blue flames of contemplation and mistreatment. The Protestant Reformation sparked a purifying fire in the Catholic Church. Like a prairie fire scorches the thick grasses, thistle, and weeds, so the heat of the Counter-Reformation moved over the land, scorching the thicket of devotions, pious customs, and theological miscellanea that had snagged and obscured the Church's purest growth. Besides the universal reforms of the Council of Trent, men and women such as St. John of the Cross were integral regional players in the Catholic Counter-Reformation. This movement stripped even mighty dioceses and religious orders of all padding, of all unnecessary raiment, and then built up a lean and muscular body of Christ that moved with purpose and vigor for the next four centuries. But for many purifiers, including St. John of the Cross, the price of such reform was steep and it was personal. Needed changes to his beloved Carmelites would mean the disruption of comfortable patterns of life. John's ideas had enemies, and for his efforts he suffered exile, hunger, public lashings, imprisonment, and defamation from the hands of his own fellow Carmelites, St. John was born into poverty and so was no stranger to need. He was raised by his mother and the church after his father died at a young age. These two mothers imparted to his mind a solid formation in Catholic doctrine and to his soul an ardent love for the Lord Jesus. John was ordained a priest for the Carmelites in 1567. He loved solitude and contemplation and so considered entering the strictest of orders, the Carthusians. But holy people cross paths, and a chance meeting with St. Teresa of Avila redirected John's vocation. Teresa's combination of charm, intelligence, and drive were difficult to resist, and John fared no better than most. He quickly joined her project to recapture the original purity of the Carmelite order. Many customs had attached themselves to the order over time like barnacles on a ship. Now was the moment to scrape off the barnacles. John set out to found new, 
reformed Carmelite houses and to reinvigorate existing ones, the reforms John and Teresa implemented were practical. The monks and nuns were to spend more hours chanting the breviary in common, to do more spiritual reading, to spend more hours in silence. To practice contemplative prayer, to abstain completely from meat and to endure longer, more radical fasts. The reformed Carmelites eventually became known after their most noticeable change. They strictly adhered to the Carmelite rule's original prohibition against wearing shoes. So by the time they were canonically established as their own order, distinct from the historic Carmelites, they were called the Discalced, or Shoeless, Carmelites. St. John spent his life traveling throughout central and southern Spain carrying out an intense priestly ministry all while living a recollected life which his own contemporaries recognized as saintly. He was a chaplain to convents, a spiritual director to university colleges, a confessor, a preacher, a founder, and a superior of monasteries. And, most distinctively, he was a contemplative who wrote with elegance and artistic flower about falling in love with God. His Dark Night of the Soul, Spiritual Canticle, Ascent of Mount Carmel, and Living Flame of Love are, on their surface, poetic masterpieces of the Spanish language. At a deeper level, they each describe, in surprising detail and through various biblical metaphors, the soul's search for Christ and its joy in finding him, or its pain in losing him. For John, being authentic was not a spirituality. Being bonded to Christ was. To see through material forms into God's inner life, to contemplate God in his very nature, was prayer. The soul seeks God like the bride seeks her bridegroom. And the bridegroom did more than manifest an image, he manifested reality. The church is both mother and bride, and her faithful learn of Christ, and seek him only inside of her life. Saint John of the Cross deepened the word mystery to include more than its objective meaning in the sacraments. For John, every soul had a mysterious union with God that had to be, and only could be, cultivated in silent contemplation. Let us pray. Saint John of the Cross, your life of prayer was deepened by your life of suffering for the good of your order. Through your writings on the mystery of God, may we come to love him, if not understand him, all the more. Amen. Presented by Father Frankie Fernandez OFM Capuchin Justice Peace Integrity Creation JPIC Capuchin Goa